Oi! Hello, everybody. Uh, Dan Tapiero, uh, founder of DTAP Capital and a co-founder of Gold Bullion International. And uh, today I have the pleasure of interviewing John Hathaway. Uh, John, good to see you. Good to see you, Dan. John is uh, a legend in the gold space for you who are um, not aware or who don't know of him. Uh, I would say certainly one of the uh, two or three most successful and, and, as I said, certainly well-known gold equity fund managers. And he's been with Tocqueville for a very long time. 22 years. 22 years. Currently the chairman of Tocqueville uh, Management. And he's just uh, done a deal recently with Sprott uh, Gold of Canada. And so I thought we'd just start off talking a little bit about what he's doing now and what, what this deal means. Uh, I think it'd be interesting for the viewers to hear. Great. Yeah. So uh, we're very excited to be joining Sprott. Sprott is, I think, becoming the go-to name in the precious metal space. Um, they are 100% about promoting what we do. Uh, they have uh, closed-end bullion funds. They have lending to the uh, junior mining space. Um, they have some uh, ETFs that are basically Canadian-based. And so by joining them, we now have access to their uh, due diligence capabilities, particularly in the smaller, smaller cap uh, space. Mm -hmm. They have numerous relationships throughout the business, which is helpful to us. And uh, last but not least, they have a, a full-time marketing group that I hope will be very uh, successful in raising a lot of money for what we do. Oh. And I think the timing is terrific because I think gold has finally turned the corner and hopefully we have the wind at our back instead of in our face as we've had for the last six years. So I'm very excited as, as is the rest of the team. We'll be continuing to do what we've always done, which is basically um, very granular due diligence on specific companies, active management, for our mutual fund and our European funds that we sub-advise. Yeah, that's very exciting. I think it's a fantastic platform. Um, why don't we just just get right into it and like start with your view on? I mean, uh, and I I, uh, I think you're right that you know after six years of of slog, gold uh, has broken out of a hundred dollar range and is now at a six year high, touched fifteen fifty. But let's talk a little bit about your you know your view of the macro backdrop because I know that plays into your overall view on gold. For sure. I, I think the sort of the bell ring, and when gold broke out of this six-year base, you can trace it back to the change in the mindset of the market, uh, where as it going into the end of last year, the expectation was that the Fed would continue to be on a path towards tightening, running off their balance sheet, uh, and basically less and less accommodative in terms of providing liquidity. And then when Powell had that press conference in late January and said, oh, um, and after the market had basically completely fallen apart in December, said, uh, oh, maybe we won't be running off the balance sheet. Maybe we'll just stand pat. Mm. That was kind of a hint that they were going to change course, which of course they have done and are, are probably going to go even further and you can sort of identify the breakout to that. And then also, I think he said similar things in June. Um, but clearly, I think the expectation of tightening is no, the pretense that they were going to be a responsible central bank is just totally out the window. And they're joining the crowd and creating more and more liquidity. We saw what they recently did in terms of the repo market. Uh, they're not calling it QE, but I don't know how they hmm. get away with that. Yeah, 60 billion a month is bigger than QE2, I think. So I think we're back on a path towards monetary debasement. Okay. And that is what we in the gold world have always expected would take place. And now it's sort of out there for everyone else to see. That's one thing. What, what are some of the other things that make you think that the gold price has more legs here? Yeah. Well, another, another uh, thing that I think about a lot is you have something like 15 to 17 trillion, nobody really knows uh, uh, how much, 
of sovereign debt that has a negative yield. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is an evidence of systemic risk that's huge, way bigger, in my opinion, than uh, the housing market or the mortgage market, toxic mortgages of 07, 08. When interest rates go up, and they will go up in my lifetime and yours, uh, there's going to be a huge amount of capital lost. It'll be held by uh, pension funds. It'll be held by um, institutions that um, are, from a regulatory point of view, have to have so-called safe assets. Obviously, I suppose central banks have it as well. But there will be capital losses that will dwarf uh, what we saw in 08. And I'm not sure how the repercussions of that, but I think they will be negative for financial assets in general. But, you know, gold has been very tied to the real rate. So if you think rates really are going up a lot, that's not necessarily positive for gold. Um, if the real rate goes up, uh, I would agree with that because uh, higher real rates are poison for gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go back to the 1970s, we had nominal rates on the short end near 20%, and 30 years were 13 or so. But the real rate was, was basically neutral to negative, mm -hmm. and that's because of inflation. So another thing that nobody expects, and why gold is a cheap, very cheap option with asymmetric returns on the return of inflation, which is the only way governments uh, will be able to deal with the unfunded liabilities in, in, in pension funds um, and entitlements will be to devalue through inflation. And, and you know, just how that comes into play, we don't know. Right. But um, to me, uh, if, if rates were to go to 1% or 2%, two things, two things are going to happen. One is, one is the high, highly valued financial assets, bonds and equities, are going are to take it on the chin. Uh, and, and two, um, that's most likely to happen under conditions of inflation. But is that your base case? I mean, we've talked quite a bit about this. You, is that mm -hmm. your base case that we at some point in the next few years have that uh, return of inflation? I wouldn't say that everything rests on that, yeah. but, but why not take a free option on the possibility, mm -hmm. which is where we sort of have to go. Yeah, I don't know uh, if we're going to have uh, the kind of inflation we saw in the 70s. But I think we'll probably have more inflation than we have now. But again, I would not rest everything on that particular point. Right. I mean, that, and that's very uh, strongly linked to uh, a view of the dollar. You're probably not thinking that we have inflation rates backing up and the dollar uh, continues to be strong. I mean, uh, no, just right. the opposite. I would right, say, exactly, I would know. say the dollar, you know, and how do you measure it? I mean, the DXY is basically a pair trade with the euro. Could the euro go up against the dollar? I mean, I, I think it can. Mm -hmm. I can think of reasons why it would, but that's not really fundamental because I think, you know, when I hear this thing, you know, in the financial media that, that the dollar is the best house in a bad neighborhood, I think to myself, this, this is ridiculous because the neighborhood's going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the dollar is the tallest midget, all these stupid a analogies. But at some point, uh, uh, capital will seek out safety, which is what gold represents. And, you know, I would, I have to point out that gold has outperformed every stock market since 2000. I mean, most people don't even think about that. And that's been in a relatively benign, I mean, over a 20-year period, we've had ups and downs. Right. So, I mean, I think that's almost separate from what your view or my view or anyone's view is. It just is a fact that it's a fact in the last 19 years. Right, gold has outperformed bonds yeah. and stocks, yeah. not only the S&P, but if you, yeah. you, and gold is in, at, at record highs in yen, I think uh, Canadian dollars, the pound, the euro, and Aussie dollars. Yeah. And, and it's just the US dollar where we're still sort of struggling. And it's because the dollar has been relatively strong compared to other currencies. Yeah, I want to get back to sort of talking more about some other things that you think are impacting the price. And we had talked a little bit about the geopolitics. Um, what's your sense there? What's your, what are the drivers there for you? You know, there's so much to talk about there. Yeah. I mean, you and I talked before this about what's going on in Turkey. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, what's, what's happening there is a disaster. And it is, it's, it's basically alienating uh, centrist-type Republicans who voted for Trump, holding their nose maybe, um, last election. And you just wonder if, if he's going to keep them. And the point of all that, and I, it, you know, going from Turkey to Trump and the election cycle, is the chances that you would get a more radical, um, very liberal, uh, populist, left-leaning administration is downright scary in terms of what it could mean for future budget deficits, for tax rates. And if you're, for example, um, allocating capital for a major corporation and you're thinking about making a major investment somewhere in the world, in the U.S. or elsewhere, and you don't know what the tax rate's going to be, you're not going to do a darn thing until the election is over. So I think there's a very good chance we could be in recession territory next year, mm. which, which um, would do a couple of things. One, one thing would be uh, the budget deficit, which just crossed a trillion this year in, in, a, in a time of economic expansion, could easily go to a trillion and a half or, or more, two trillion. I mean, you know, it's going to be way higher than anyone thinks. So that won't do wonders for the credit rating of the U.S. dollar, and that's how you could get uh, a much weaker dollar, which gets back to um, uh, investors' capital looking for a diversifier, um, a, um, a non-correlated asset that could protect capital during, under those circumstances, which what I would imagine to be adverse capital markets. I mean, it looks to me like Trump has this thing already in the bag, but it sounds like you think that Warren has a, has a decent shot here. Um, I, I don't know. I okay. mean, I just don't know. I mean, but I think I think yeah. that he is beginning to lose uh, the center that 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 held together for him in in sixteen, mm -hmm. and you know it may mean that just some of those people will not come out to vote. I don't really know. You know, if it's scary enough on the left, maybe he he still gets in. But I do think it's more in question today than it might have been three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. And what about the China-U.S.? Ah, uh, the China deal. Yeah, the, or no deal, or who, who knows oh, exactly. What's, what and do that's you think? a joke yeah. to me. Yeah. Because okay. uh, when gold got pounded uh, a couple of weeks ago because we were going to have this fantastic uh, once-in-a-lifetime you know, tying all the loose ends together deal, that's when gold got smacked. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the thinking was, I'm sure, in terms of, you know, the sort of re reflex action was, well, all our problems, all the, all the sort of um, volatility we've had over the summer in the equity market, the uncertainty about the economy was all because of tariffs and because of no deal and Trump playing tough. And... And so what, what we have is a show of American weakness and, and the Chinese playing Trump like a fiddle uh, because, you know, Trump said it's the best deal ever. The Chinese are saying, well, you may, you know, maybe, but we still have to talk. They're talking about staging it. You know, uh, everything I read about it makes me think that they're really, we're not sure if there's a deal. And being in an, an election year, I think the, the Chinese have the strongest hand, and that's going to come out in many different ways. Um, so I don't think that the so-called Chinese deal, whatever it is, we don't really know, is the cure-all for what was taking place causing uh, market volatility and, and downside risk. Okay, so you've, you've put together a few of the macro points that I think are driving your view. So... What's the forecast on the gold price in your head? Let's say, eighteen months, and then let, you know, let's go five years out. You know the, the the way I've heard it put best, and I've learned after all these years never to put a number and a date in the same sentence in terms of any kind of price. That's okay. Let's just let, what do you I got? I know we're among friends. What do you got? Right. <laughs> so what I what I the way I like to I thought it was very well put by David Rosenberg of Gluskin Chef. Okay. And David gave an interview with the National Post in Canada 
And then he and I sat on the same stage at Beaver Creek and we talked about it further. And what he said, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is that we have a cycle high in bonds in terms of valuation. We have a cycle high in stocks in terms of valuation. And the one major asset class that's been left behind is gold. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer said, uh, would you be surprised by $3,000 gold? Now, this is a guy who's not a gold guy. Yeah, He's a rational economist, made his career you're Somewhat shaking rational. your head. Somewhat rational. To I the, mean, I've, I've, I've read his stuff over the years. Yeah, okay. But I mean, he's, you know, he's yeah. a well-respected re, well, yeah. well guy. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, not, he's not in the gold camp. Right. But he said he would not be surprised by $3,000 gold. Yeah. And I think that his point was that gold needs to make a cycle high and, you know, pick, a, pick any number. I mean, So well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. So why, why do you think it hasn't? Why have people been hesitant? Uh, I mean, it just broke out a few months ago, right. and it was dead to the world for years, six right. years. So what's kept them back from from buying? And then, like, what, what's going to get them to allocate? Great question, and that's what I think about all the time. So yeah. uh, uh, I think the fact that uh, mainstream investing, S&P, names, uh, tech, yeah. socks, all that has done fine. So why would you venture into something that hasn't performed? And frankly, it's the third rail of investment ideas because I know I've heard of uh, your partner getting tossed out of an office because he was gonna talk about gold. He said, don't you dare talk about gold to my team, you know, some RIA in mm -hmm. Wisconsin or someplace like that. Right. So why is it the third rail? Because it hasn't performed for six years. No, it's the number one performer from 2000. People but ignore that. Memories are short. But, right, of uh, course. And that's, we understand that. Right. But the other thing is that, that even when I talk to somebody who uh, could allocate to gold, they may do it personally, but they will not do it for their clients because there's career risk. If you underperform, the stock if you're a mainstream investor and you're and you're 20 basis points, let's say, behind the S&P, and you had a 5% allocation to GLD or GDX or yeah. the kind of thing we do, you could get, you could get canned. Uh, you certainly would find you know, tremendous disapproval. Okay, well, doesn't that mentality have to change? Well, there was a time, to have, and to I have remember it, yeah. when gold was really doing well, and everybody yeah. wanted in at the top. Yeah. So you mean ten, eleven, or do you yeah, mean uh, eleven? Yeah, seventy-eight. So, okay. Well, yeah, no, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. old enough, yeah, but yeah, I, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't doing yeah, gold then. Yeah. But um, that just shows you how cycles work, and how how psychology changes. So we are kind of just coming out of like a, a six-year nuclear winter, and it's hesitation, early stage stuff. Just an interesting little fact is that even though the gold-backed ETFs have gained uh, AUMs this year, GDX has lost like a billion six, even though it's up 35%. Yeah, GDX is the uh, gold miner ETF. The gold miner, we'll, we'll, Van Eck We'll gold. get into that in a, in a, in a, in, second. In a minute. Yeah. yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> okay, so, you know, again, you, you know, you say nuclear winner, um, and I'm still trying to figure out, so what, what gets people to to have a different mentality. And the way you responded to that uh, was really to refer to sort of the US institutional investor. But we know, you know, 70% of global demand for gold is China, India, and the emerging markets. Right. And so maybe it's the US institutional investor is not changing their view until it's at 2,500 or 2,800. Probably. Or, so isn't the next leg here going to be driven by, I mean, we've seen, we've seen huge Russian central bank buying. We know the Chinese are buying. Do you have any sense as to what, you know, what might drive them to you know, take us to the next level? You're talking about the R US RIA? No, no, I'm talking about the foreign demand. Um, you know, what, they've been steady, but is there something that, because I don't know that the IRAs without something more obvious like, okay, MMT is coming in, mm -hmm. you know, something really Things obvious like, like that. that. I don't know that they'll switch uh, in this concept of career risk. Um, I don't really understand that, but you know, that, I, I know it exists. 
I just wonder, is there something on globally that you, you think could get the global buyers? Because, you know, we're here in America, and America is still the wealthiest country in the world, but we're not a driver for gold. Not, not now. Not now. We will be. Okay, so uh, you think we yeah, will I think, be? I think the marginal okay. buyer That's interesting. Yeah. are investment flows in Western capital markets, Europe, um, U.S., and so forth. So why haven't the Europeans with all those negative bonds, all their bonds are yielding negative. You would have thought that, you know, they would have taken gold up to 2,000, 2,500. I, I, I think there is, a, I, mean, I know in, in Germany, yeah. where we sub-advise uh, usage, um, there has been physical buying um, and, and substantial, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but there has been substantial buying, particularly in Germany. But uh, I don't think, uh, and I probably would disagree, people would disagree with me on this point, I do not think that physical buying of metal has been steady and, and particularly by central banks uh, rising. I don't think that that drives the gold price as much as people might think. And we can talk about supply and demand in a second. Mm -hmm. I think that the that the, it's the it's the movement of capital into gold surrogates, which would be uh, futures, COMEX futures, derivatives, and all you know options, and all that sort of thing. The leveraged money. The leveraged money. Uh, what, that really is more of a market moving explanation than the steady sort of ab absorption of physical metal in the 70% of the world we just talked about. Because that's almost always there. And what happens actually, now the, the gold price has moved up this year, uh, the Indians have backed away. Mm. Uh, they'll come back, but they'll wait for a while and, and see if the price sort of settles in because it's kind of in the DNA of most Asians to have physical metal. Um, and and it's, some, it's almost always there. Um, central banks, are taking up a huge amount of gold. But I think the swing factor is comes down to the leveraged players that so buy. So you mean Paul Tudor Jones sticking up his hand and saying, it's my favorite bet over the next two years and I see 1,700. That's that's going to get. I don't, I don't, that's, <laughs> he did, he said that a I, few I know, ago. I know yeah, he yeah. said it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got a lot of these, <laughs> these really elite luminaries like uh, yeah. Ray Dalio and. Yeah. Rick Reeder, the, the bond guy at yeah. uh, BlackRock. I mean, they're all saying the right things. Mm -hmm. And you want, kind of wonder, say, well, why aren't people doing anything about it? And I think it comes back to what I said earlier, is that it's just so, it's just been in so, so much of a penalty box for so many years, and the career, career risk that goes with it. You know, that'll change, but that's, that's kind of what... But that's good. It's got to climb a wall of worry, and if yeah. everyone were... You know, uh, jumping they were up on and board, down about it, it it's we, done already. I mean, exactly right. So right, okay. So let's move a little bit now to the the the, the supply demand picture. Uh, you know, which sure. you know a ton about. Yeah, you know, no, plays. I mean, um, you can get the numbers from the Gold Council. I mean, they're yeah. they're pretty much the Bible when it comes to yeah. that. You kind of have to look at it. The picture is really uh, you have uh, supply which is new mine supply, is, is sort of flattening out. And it, it probably is on a glide path lower. I would oh, that's say- That's interesting. It's yeah. a glide path lower, maybe for five, six, seven years. I don't know. Really? And that's because of how hard it is to build a new mine today. And these big miners, little miners, big miners, collectively have a reserve life that's the lowest it's been in 30 years. And I think wow. on average, it might be 10 years, 11, something like that. Yeah, all the gold critics always say, you know, oh, well, you can always dig more out of the ground. But yeah, you can if you can get permits, if you can go to, a, uh, you know, a lot of the gold is located. In Turkey, you mentioned. Turkey, uh, uh, which is one of the better ones. Right. You know, try Burkina Faso, try, uh, right. you know, places... Uh, Argentina, rule of law is uh, very changeable. Right. So, you know, is capital going to go into a place like that? Well, in some cases, yes, but mostly no. And, and so you've got that at work. You've also got ESG is a huge thing now. 
And so it's, get uh, uh, environmental. Oh, oh, so oh, so where where it's coming from? So like where it's coming from yeah, and, yeah, and, right. and permitting. You know. So I, maybe just explain that a second. I mean, that's the ESG. Yeah. It's just getting permits. Yeah. The mining industry has a bad rap to of, of having you know rape the yeah. landscape. Yeah. And that was probably uh, deserved maybe 50 years ago, but. You cannot build a mine today anywhere, I don't care what country, uh, without complying with first world standards on emissions, um, mm -hmm. dealing with uh, toxic uh, uh, things like Run cyanide, yeah, which is used. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, getting, and getting the permitting is excruciating and getting more so all the time. So what used to take maybe five years now takes 10 years, 10 years, Maybe longer. There are mine. There's a mine. It probably could be a great mine in in Romania that everybody's known about for God. I've known about it yeah. since I've been doing it yeah, for twenty I've years. Know, I even know about it. <laughs> yeah, and and it's yeah. not getting built because the environmental movement, the green, you know, it, not to be pejorative, but they're they have successfully blocked it. Yeah. So I, I when I say a glide path down um, for five years, it could be longer. Mm -hmm. Just because the hurdle is so high, so it it would take a significantly higher gold price to really tease that gold out. Exactly. Right. And, and so, I don't know what number that is, but it 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 isn't another two or three hundred dollars. It's probably five years of steady prices in you know closer to two thousand. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, and I think that that's important to think about it in uh, within that framework because. Um, it sort of puts uh, a base underneath uh, the price. So if you're, it's fifteen hundred. If you're concerned, oh, it might go back to eleven hundred, twelve hundred. If we're on a glide path lower in supply, mm -hmm. that it's going to be very difficult for it to stay down if it goes back down for whatever reason. It, let's pretend it goes to thirteen hundred. Right. Right. It's going to scare the devil out of uh, investors. It's going to scare the mining companies. Uh, they'll just go into a bigger shell, you know, hide further under their desks, whatever. So the mining companies, the big ones like Newmont and um, maybe uh, Barrick, for example, are still using $1,200 gold to value their reserves. Mm. And if they're using it to value their reserves, that's how they value a potential uh, new mine. And you know the numbers don't work at 1,200. Period. It's almost more bullish long term if we do go back down. Well, right? I wouldn't. In a way, I wouldn't I mean, enjoy we, it. But I, it but, <laughs> no, but, I, yeah. I don't want it either. Trust yeah. me, I don't. Yeah. But the way the 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 you know the way. Yeah, no, the, that it would just it would just uh, cure the. It would it would just uh, give you another five years of of no new significant right. supply. So you said something we, recently. We were chatting that you were, were at a, a, a conference or a meetup. Your team met over sixty companies. Right. So could you? I mean, I, I don't think many of these viewers get to talk to even one company. They wouldn't so, want to. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well. Anyway, you've got a whole team and you're very engaged. So maybe some of your observations from those conversations would be interesting for sure. people to hear. There are. Uh, a couple of mining conferences yeah. every year that I go to, they're very helpful for me and the rest of the team. One is the Denver Gold Show, which takes place in September every year. Uh, another one is the uh, Precious Metal Summit, which takes place in Beaver Creek every year, very close to- To where you live. To where I live. <laughs> so it's but very also, easy. It's, all, it's convenient. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it also uh, is, is uh, good because it has all the smaller companies. And then BMO has one in, in Florida, Hollywood, Florida, near Miami, every February. So you know that's how we how I stay in touch. Now the team basically they're in touch all the time, uh, but I get to see in the space of those four or five days sixty different CEOs. So what were some of the you know your observations that really stuck out? You know what, that you found really interesting. Essentially, uh, they don't believe the gold price. Oh. They're not excited about it. Okay. Uh, they're, I think, conditioned by years of having been beaten down. 
mm-hmm. by investors, by low stock prices, um, to be ultra conservative. And there's just not a lot in the pipeline of new mines as a result. They've cut back on um, exploration. When you see Barrick and uh, uh, Rangold getting together, I think uh, there's a, va- a lot of vacant office space in Toronto hmm. as a result of that. And uh, when Gold Corp and Newmont got together, there's a lot of vacant office space in Vancouver, where Gold Corp used to be headquartered. And so the intellectual capital of the business and, and the lifeblood of uh, new mine development is your, your geological staff. And if you cut back on that the way it's been cut back on, basically truncated completely, you don't see it in the numbers so much, but certainly there might be fewer projects that are looked at, fewer projects that are advanced. Um, and so that would be one observation. But I think basically the, they're, 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 they look at, as most, uh, pe- most people do in the investment world, and it happens in business too, they look at life with a rear view mirror. And they look at the past five or six years and they're, they're super reluctant to stick their neck out to spend two, three, four billion, which is, which is what it takes to build a significant new mine. But you're you're very bullish generally on the sector, and I think you mentioned before the GDX, which is the what's Van Eck ETF, the Van Eck ETF on uh, larger uh, gold miners. Right. I mean, I looked at the chart uh, recently, and it's at the same price basically that it was in 2008, which is totally crazy given what looks like to be a pretty good future. So, right. What do you what what what's your sense? just broadly about the sector, why why you think, can we go back up to those highs that we were at in, you know, 06, 07? And it has or? to be driven by the gold price. Okay. I mean, you know, you look at the fundamentals and every company has different aspects to it. There's, you know, local political risk. There are uh, so many different things in terms of vetting an asset and vetting a management. But at the end of the day, there's only one thing that really matters, and that's the gold price. Well, it's also how they manage their businesses. There's I mean, all of that. that right. You can't. It, right. You, you but have it's to not going to have a big move. It's without. Right. You're not going to get. You're right. not going to get yeah. uh, generalist investors coming into the space. Yeah. Unless you have an eye popping move in the gold price. But these things are are really super cheap. I mean, some of them trading at four or five times they're, EBITDA. They're ridiculous. Uh, yeah. you Particularly know, the smaller ones. Yeah. And it, it's, it's almost, it's to the point where, and we, we figure this, that um, you can buy a new mine by buying an existing company at a 35% discount to what it would cost, let's pretend you're New Mod or Newcrest or one of them, to start from scratch. So they're just So, you know, the make or buy. You, you know, you can buy, you can pay a premium in the, a premium in the market for a, a single asset company and have it be accretive to obviously the target and also to your own shareholders. And you're saving all that money on building a new mine. So I've never seen that in 20 years of doing this. Really? Never never seen it. So Wow, that is cheap. To me, that just suggests that um, when the psychology changes somewhat, this is again in the corporate suites of the larger companies, Yeah, that you will see uh, some not merger of equals, which was Barrick, uh, Rangold, for example, but um, larger companies swallowing up smaller ones. Yeah, that's that's exciting. So why don't we talk about some of those companies or your favorite? I, I think that you know later on we're going to actually talk a little bit about Bitcoin, if you can believe that or not, and crypto. Happy only to. a little, only a little bit. I, um, John's probably the only person in the entire world who can speak about gold mining uh, equities and uh, and Bitcoin at the same time. But the reason I mention that is that there are companies in this space that have the, the ability to go up three, four, five, you know, e- even 10 times. And those are sort of Bitcoin type numbers. Right. And so, you know, I know you have some favorites and maybe just Tell us. The thesis really was what we've just talked about, which is the inevitability of, of M&A. Mm-hmm. And, and the observation that uh, there are, are companies that are trading at, that are generating free cash, trading at four and five times EBITDA. You know, having been a value investor back in the 70s, I remember that was pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. And you, you look around in the markets and say, well, what, 
what else is there? And, you know, I come back to this space as being a standout in terms of valuation. Yeah, especially given that the backdrop, both macro and what I would call macro gold, right. are so positive. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, mean, there seems to be a complete disconnect. And I think that's because, I think because yeah. you, you've, you've sort of gone to this passive investing where right. capital, you know, sort of hyperactive capital flows can go in and out of something like GDX. And um, when you look at the uh, array of um, research that's done on the sell side, it's basically there to serve the investment bankers. So we have, we have uh, uh, extreme value. Yeah. Uh, you have reason to think that um, earnings will rise substantially because of a view on, a go on the gold price. Not everybody would agree, but if you think that, yeah. you can make a case, and then you have the possibility of M&A, you can make a case that you have a lot of 10 baggers in, in market caps of a billion dollars. So give us a give us a few names. Sure. Like what are your yeah you know, that okay that you a, think a are... handful of names. Uh, uh, one would be Detour Gold. Okay. It's a low grade but long lived mine in Canada, mm -hmm. where we've just gone through a very constructive replacement of the old board, installed a new board uh, and new management at the highest level, where all the blocking and tackling that you need to do in a, in a large open pit, uh, low grade mine needs to be done. But suddenly this company, and we're not all the way there yet, is starting to gush free cash. Hmm. Even at, at these gold prices, uh, call it 14. And what's the market cap there? Uh, it would be a couple billion Canadian, mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and it's, it's a, in my mind, it's a crown jewel the kind of asset, because if the mine life of the industry is collectively, say, 10, 11 years, you want something in Canada that has a 20-plus year mine life. And that's just knowing what we know now. I mean, we haven't even talked about discovery around the existing mine works. Mm -hmm. So that would be one example that's liquid that you, you know, easily buy and, you know, maybe get out of if you change your mind. Um, but that would be, uh, you know, a top favorite let's call it. And another one would be Torex, which is, has a, a mine in um, Mexico that is generating tons of free cash. I think it's trading at four to five times EBITDA. Mm -hmm. And I forget the multiple on free cash, but it's significant. And it's a single asset company, so there's a single asset company discount. And one thing I didn't mention is that when a new mine would come along, all the headline worries about labor strife and so forth in that particular state of Mexico, which there has been, would go away because it's, it's sort of taken up into the fact that, uh, pretend it was Newmont, uh, has 13 mines that people don't focus on local issues the way they do on a single asset company. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part one. Part two is that uh, they have a new technology which, uh, can take 30% out of mining costs. And I won't get into it, but it, it's been developed by them. And it basically has to do with mechanization. Some of it's off the shelf, some of it's proprietary, it's all patented. And what I think will happen with Torex is that they will be able to buy stripper type assets, you know, stripper wells, but assets have been, have been given up for dead by the existing owners but with their technology, they can bring them back to life and maybe get oh. another 10 years out of them. Wow. And you know that single company discount, single asset discount, if they're successful in doing this, and um, I expect them to start um, act actively doing this in the next 12 months, mm. uh, then it disappears. Mm. And suddenly Torex has mines all over the place that everybody thought were no good. And so anyway, that's another one. Oh, that's interesting. Um, one more, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mag Silver, which has a joint venture with Fresnillo in Mexico. It's called Juan Escipio, which is neither here nor there, but very high grade. We'll start producing in 2020, at the end of next year, 
and the uh, cash generation will be, will be, because of the grade, and without any sort of heroic assumptions on the silver price, will be very substantial. Um, Fresneo operates the mine. The ground has tremendous exploration potential, so it, in, in our minds, in our analysis, the initial production of 4,000 tons per day will double soon thereafter to 8,000. None of that's in the share price. Um, there's nothing in the share price for a better silver price. Yeah, which I see as sort of a leveraged gold. It's, it's, without it's getting into gold the on steroids. Yeah it's, yeah, it's gold yeah. on steroids. Yeah, but you know, so those are two in Mexico, and you did mention you're concerned about jurisdictional right. issues. So I, I wonder, is there something in the U.S. or something else in North America that you that you like? I mean, for people who who don't want to venture outside. Sure. Um, yeah, they're they're again the the world is shrinking in terms of yeah. what you your comfort level with um, uh, specific jurisdictions. I mean, to me, Detour is the is the sort of the icon okay. of, of of that. But you could also mention something like Nova Gold. Our friend Tom Kaplan is very yes. prominent in. Yes. But the mine is located in Alaska. It's owned jointly with Barrick. It will get built, and when it gets built, it will be the biggest. Uh, gold mine in the world, the biggest, longest life. It'll be a fantastic asset. They're biding their time. Barrick is biding its time. It's gonna, it's gonna happen because it's, it, it just has to happen. But that doesn't. Does that contradict your comment earlier about supply sort of running off? No, over none the of next what I've talked. None years? of none of what I've talked about is big enough. Okay. Even this mine. Right to change that, or big enough, quick enough. Big or, enough, quick yeah. enough. It just, it, it, it's just yeah. it's episodic. It's just not. It's not like oil where you can suddenly punch a bunch of you know, or or a new technology that would suddenly uh, you know make uneconomic ground become economic. Um, yeah. So you just don't have that. So yeah, Nova Gold would be again safe jurisdiction, um, and uh, you know, fabulous asset, mm -hmm. smart people. Super well leveraged, financed, super leveraged, and it's a, it's a it's a it's a yeah. to me it's, it's a perpetual call mm -hmm. on the gold price. Yeah, so that's that's very interesting, and and I would say, I mean, these days I don't really hear about gold miners from anybody. That's I mean, because not even in nobody. passing, which is I, I know someone I, I mentioned to somebody that I was uh, interviewing you, and they're like, oh, John, great guy like one of the few survivors of, you know, the last six years, but yeah. is now in a very good position. And so if basically, if you if you haven't had to be in the market or weren't in the market in the past uh, six years, now, you know, now's, now's a wonderful time. You're yeah, no, I, nicely, I mean, I'm excited. Know. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of work. We know a lot of all the assets and mm -hmm. uh, stuff that's, uh, still in development so i think we have concentrated in our small group a lot of a lot of uh, intellectual capital that's going to be very hard to replicate at least for a few years okay well let's let's make a slight little shift a detour uh to uh, Guess talk what? about about bitcoin a little yeah. bit because i think there's a universe out there uh of which i'm uh, uh, a part that think that Bitcoin really is hard money. Mm -hmm. I don't like using the phrase digital gold because I think that Bitcoin is a lot more than that. I think it's, it's you know, as I've said, it's 20 things and maybe this is one of them. You know, coming from a traditional gold background, I think it's, it's interesting that you've, you know, you've engaged with it. And so why don't we just tell the audience some of your thoughts and sure. what you think of it? Because there are a lot of people in the gold world who are, not friendly towards Bitcoin. And people, I would say, generally over the age of 50, 55, their immediate uh, response is that it's, uh, it's magic uh, hooey fooey money and you know it's a fraud or they talk about Mount Gox still or whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's fascinating that you don't see it that way. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm way less knowledgeable uh, on this than uh, on gold, but what what I think it's important to know about because some people think of it as money, 
used in a transactional form, maybe as a store of value. And, um, you know, in my position, I need to know about at least something about it. My observation would be that, that money is never constant. It's always changing. It's evolving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think, you know, back a few years ago, you would, you would pay for things in cash. I mean, who uses cash now? Yeah. Credit cards are the only way to go. And, you know, so why can't it go beyond that to digital transactions? I mean, it's so much more convenient. That has nothing to do with the merits of gold. I, I, look, at, I look at Bitcoin as being, it, it's related to gold. Uh, it's part of an evolution of um, what money is all about. And I, I, don't think it, I don't think Bitcoin threatens gold, but I think it can be useful and used in, in a monetary sense. It can be an investment, a speculation, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't understand it beyond that, but I don't, I don't, I think people in the gold space need to know that it's not a threat. I mean, if anything, it's an ally because I see it as having been uh, invented, sponsored by people who tr did not trust the financial system as it stands, paper currency, central banks, all of that. So, I mean, anybody who's sort of of that persuasion has to be thought of as, as, in some way or another, as an ally. Um, and that's how I see it. You know, the, the biggest problem with this whole space is it's, I, I say, it's like a language problem that every person you speak with, and this is no joke, articulates what Bitcoin is to them differently. Mm -hmm. So it's not like saying gold, yellow metal. We all agree on that. Oh, but everybody has Bitcoin, a different, yeah. If I say Bitcoin, what does that mean? You're going to get something different from each person. So, like, so I, someone might say, a gold person might say, "Oh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, scarcity, right? Because there's scare Bitcoin right. is supposedly scarce." Someone might else say, "Might say digital money." Someone might say, "You know, um, programmable money." Someone might say, "You know, fraud." I mean, it just, it's unbelievable. Yeah, see what, and, and, and the, so the way you the, articulate yeah, right to, from... To me, I, the, the yeah. last thing I would do is get in a pissing contest yeah. about Bitcoin. Right. As far as I'm concerned, if it works, yeah. that's great. Yeah. It's not a threat to gold, but it's, it's yeah. kind of like and you said that. a fellow traveler. Thanks uh, for that talk and update on your views. I think it was a fantastic interview. Thanks. Fantastic.